All right, my name's uh, Matt Rudd. I did, uh, I'm giving the lecture today on sleep alertness and fatigue and education, or fatigue, education, and residency, uh, SAFER. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I, uh, I went to undergraduate at the uh, university, or uh, the Ohio State University um, in bio, uh, chemical and biomolecular engineering, then went to the University of Kentucky in uh, biomedical engineering. Um, and then uh, before I got my degree there, went to the University of Tennessee uh, in Memphis for, or University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis for uh, uh, medical school. Then I did my internal medicine residency as well as my uh, pulmonary and critical care fellowship there. Then went down to the University of South Florida for, uh, for sleep medicine fellowship and then uh, came up here. So this is my first job out of, out of uh, school. All right, so some of y'all might feel like this at times. Uh, I know I've seen people like this, especially on nights. Uh, so I don't have any disclosures. Let's go over the learning objectives. Uh, first, let's list some factors that put you at risk for sleepiness and fatigue. Uh, second, we'll recognize signs of sleepiness and fatigue in yourself and others by the, by the end of this lecture. Uh, three is we'll describe the impact of sleep loss on residents' personal and professional lives and on resident and patient safety. Fourth, we'll challenge some common misconceptions among physicians about sleep and sleep loss. And then fifth, we'll adapt alertness management tools and strategies for yourself and your program. All right, so why do we sleep? So first, I just want to kind of give an overview of, of why we sleep, how sleep works, and, um, and this will kind of give us a, a frame of reference for all the things that we're gonna talk about throughout the lecture. So the functions of sleep include rest uh, and energy conservation, restoration of the brain and body, uh, and that includes clearance of built up chemicals in the brain, also replenishment of chemicals in the brain. So throughout the day, you use some of these chemicals and then you build up some of these chemicals and at night, you want to do the opposite. You want to replenish the things that you use during the day and you, you want to um, get rid of the things that built up during the day. Um, and then healing and cellular uh, tissue repair and then uh, memory consolidation. Oh, and then uh, just a, a quote that uh, even as early as, as somewhere around 35 AD, um, uh, this guy, uh, Marcus Fabian uh, Quintilinius, um, said that it's a curious fact of which the reason is not obvious that the interval of a single night will greatly increase the strength of the memory. So even that early, they recognize that sleep is important. Uh, and we're learning all the time that, uh, especially recently over the last, say, 20 or so years, uh, just how important it is. So first, there's a two uh, process model of sleep regulation. The first process is process S. That's your homeostatic sleep drive. So the longer we go without sleep, the more sleepy we become. It's just like your hunger drive. The longer you, you go without food, the more hungry you are. Also, um, the, 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 when you sleep, you have, uh, it doesn't take long to have, have kind of overcome this. So it's just like if you go eat a little bit of food, you may not feel so hungry anymore. Um, that may kind of tide you over for a while. Same with process S. All right, so for process C, that's the circadian rhythm. Um, everybody's heard about it, but it's our body's approximately 24 hour internal clock. Um, the reason that says approximately is because not everybody is the same, first of all. Um, and it's, it's a, just a little bit longer than 24 hours. So time is a human construct. Uh, we try to make things fit uh, the way we want them to fit, but our body doesn't always recognize that. So um, everybody's uh, uh, internal clock is a little bit different, but it's somewhere around 24.2 uh, hours. Uh, this regulates things like sleep, hormones, body temperature, digestion, and immune system. All right, so process X, What's, what makes us sleepy? Um, this is the, that, some of that buildup that we talked about. So as you're awake, your body uses uh, ATP for energy. And, and as those phosphate groups are cleaved and the energy is used, we're stuck with, uh, we're left with adenosine. And that builds up throughout the day, throughout your waking uh, time. After the accumulation of adenosine, um, those activate adenosine receptors, which prevent the release of dopamine. Dopamine, dopamine is a wake-promoting chemical, 
and um, and by preventing the release, then uh, you, you feel more tired. The longer we stay awake, the more adenosine accumulates. And then during early sleep, like I mentioned, it doesn't take long. Adenosine is converted back to ATP, and there's a rapid replenishment of brain ATP. Uh, coffee. Coffee blocks the adenosine receptors. So you don't get that response to the buildup of adenosine and dopamine is still being released, which increases your wakefulness. This is how coffee works and, um, and why it works. And we'll get in, into a, a little bit uh, more detail on coffee. All right, so process C. So this is what regulates our arousal during the day. So this is all driven from the, the kind of your, your body's internal clock and the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, and so a typical, a typical cycle is 24.2 hours. That's kind of the average. Everybody's a little bit different and this is genetically driven. So there's not, you can't change this as, as much as you want to try to change this. Your body has, has a set clock and it's somewhere around 24.2 hours. Um, the things that kind of help regulate this are called, uh, Zeitgebers are, um, the biggest one is light, but these are, these are things that in the environment, that allow your body to respond to the Zeitgeber and kind of set this train or entrain this clock to work. Um, specifically, one of the reasons we tell patients to avoid light in the afternoon is, uh, or in the late afternoon and evening, uh, is because uh, blue light especially hits these, these cells in the back of your uh, eye called the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, which, which release melanopsin. Melanopsin through a process through the suprachiasmatic nucleus acts on the pineal gland to reduce melatonin production and release. And so what happens is if you have light and it hits and it activates those uh, retinal cells, then you decrease your melatonin production. You don't feel as tired. All right. So that's one of the, one of the reasons that we tell patients to avoid screens and things because they all have blue light They're, They actually sell special lights um, without blue light in them that are great for like night lights. All right, so these are all the things that are affected by the circadian uh, rhythm, by, by your circadian system. Um, so you can, you can kind of see, and we're, we're learning more about this all the time over, I don't know, last years, a uh, few years now, they've realized how important the gut is. So the gut releases things like leptin and ghrelin. That's part of the circadian rhythm. They actually help activate some of the circadian rhythm. There's, uh, in the brain and then the brain kind of helps activate release of those. So these things work. It's not, a, it's not a one way system. That's the brain's just sending signals out. The, um, your body actually sends signals to the brain. The brain sends signals to the body and that's what kind of runs your, runs your life. All right. So this, this is on an, on a cellular level. You don't really need to know this, but you, you might hear things like the biological clock genes. And so um, these clock genes, the, kind of produce these proteins, B, mol one and clock. These proteins produce uh, or kind of bind to gene genetics uh, coding and, and release uh, proteins per and cry. This is, uh, so the, the B, mol one and clock genes are the positive, uh, positive side of that loop. The uh, per and cry actually dimerize, go back into the nucleus to turn off this system. So it's kind of like a, a switch. All right, so you turn it on with the beam on clock, you turn it off with the purr and cry as these things are produced. So it's a negative feedback loop. But uh, this is kind of what I was talking about with the, the melatonin release and, and light, but early in the night, so about two hours prior to your sleep time, um, you will start releasing melatonin. That kind of gets you tired. That's why sleep um, routines are so important. So your body recognizes these things. We don't, a lot of times we don't think about it that way, but you, again, I think kids are so fast, fascinating because you can, you kind of make them do things and, and then you see the results of it with adults. We don't, we don't, we aren't as regimented as sometimes as children, as we want our children to be. So we don't do these things. You just kind of have this, this process. Then you go to bed, you're busy one night, you know, we have things going on in our lives, but if you can get onto a nice schedule and a routine, it actually really helps. Um, so your body starts to recognize your routine about two hours before you go to bed. It starts releasing the melatonin. Um, then throughout the night, your core body temperature drops about two hours before your habitual wake up time. Um, that's when your body temperature is the lowest and it kind of starts the process of waking up. And so that's why sometimes if you wake up 
within two hours of your habitual wake up time, it can be difficult to get back to sleep. Same things. If you go to sleep to two, say two hours before your habitual bedtime, then you're going to have a hard time maybe going back to sleep in two hours because you get that refreshment. All right. So we already talked about this. This is just the, the uh, blue light reflex kind of uh, going to hit those retinal cells, going back through the suprachiasmatic nucleus and going into the pineal gland to uh, suppress melatonin release. All right. So these two processes kind of work together. And so this is, this is throughout your day. So um, think of the uh, process S, like I said, is the homeostatic sleep drive. So when you wake up, it starts to build up. This is it's building up as it as the arrow is pointing down, but uh, it's building up throughout the day. Then you fall asleep and it starts to go back down. All right. The, the circadian rhythm actually has like two little bumps. There's a bump kind of early or a, uh, I should say a trough kind of early in the afternoon. So you wake up in the morning, uh, it starts to build up, but then you kind of have this trough. That's kind of after lunch when you might feel a little tired and then um, kind of goes back up. You're more alert sometime probably around nine, uh, eight, nine p.m. And then it kind of drops back off as you sleep. And so this alertness level, that red line, um, the, the troughs in that line are kind of the best times to, to get naps because that's your, your body's most uh, driven time to sleep. So again, kind of early afternoon, sometime around 3 p.m., uh, you start to drop off there. Same thing around 9 p.m., your body starts to, to get sleepy. This is, again, this is for most people. This isn't for every single person. There's sleep disorders and things that, that we try to adjust these things on, but, but this is uh, kind, of, kind of how it works. So then, all right, so how much sleep do we need? Well, it changes throughout your life. So babies, um, especially neonates, need a lot more sleep than the elderly, and you kind of see that um, but here's a chart kind of recommended for the recommended sleep durations uh, throughout life. Again, this changes pretty rapidly in your childhood and teenage years. Once you get to about 18 years old, it, you pretty much have it set for the rest of life. But uh, oh, I thought I have a, sl a slide later on on um, how the sleep uh, quality changes throughout your life. So like your sleep stages and things change throughout life. But this is but this is kind of that seven to nine hours, say, eight, let's call it eight hours is pretty typical throughout your life. And then you kind of see there, if you start getting below six, that's, there's something wrong. All right. So um, you might hear people say, well, I don't need that much. And we'll kind of get in some of that, but they do. Um, all right. So Thomas Edison. So he, he created this electric lamp called the light bulb nowadays that uh, this was his patent um, January 27th, 1880. Um, and, and why is that important? Well, this is a study they did on, um, on uh, uh, Argentinian communities. Um, there were two communities. One had access to electricity and one did not, but they had very similar, similar social structures. And what they found is that the group without electricity had a longer sleep duration, both in the summer and winter months. So about 43 more minutes per night um, in the summer and about 56 more minutes a night in the winter. So if you, I mean, about an hour a day, they're getting more sleep. And again, that's kind of your body's, that's the nat, if you think about it, that's kind of the natural thing that your body wants. And so by introducing artificial light, what, what this, and this was a very small study, I think there were like 11 participants, but what, what it did show is that there's probably something with artificial light that our body's now not getting the sleep that it actually wants. And it's, that is kind of a, uh, uh, a natural thing. All right. So now why are residents at sleep for risk, uh, or, or risk for sleepiness? Um, besides Thomas Edison, the, uh, insufficient sleep. So on-call sleep loss, inadequate sleep recovery, fragmented sleep, your pager's going off, you're getting phone calls in the middle of the night. Um, circadian rhythm disruption. So you, you're going from days to nights, you have, you know, weekend coverage might be a little bit longer, um, and then you can have sleep disorders too. So, so they're not, um, you don't start getting sleep disorders only after residency. All right. So this is one of the scales that we use to look at how, how tired are people, how sleepy are people? Um, and so we ask these questions. Um, there are eight questions. You give us a score of zero. I never doze off during these situations to a high chance of dozing off uh, during these situations. And then we score it. 10 or greater is, is, means you have excessive daytime sleepiness. So if you're looking at these and you're going, 
Uh, yeah, mine's about a 12 and you're probably excessive. Well, not you probably, you are excessively sleepy. And so, um, you know, we need to do something about that because if you're living your life that way, there are consequences to, to being this sleepy, um, both kind of being tired and, and mistakes and things like that, but also on a physiologic level, um, uh, there's some disease processes. All right. So this is a, a study that looked at, um, residents Epworth scales. And so you look there normal, if you say normal is really normal is less than 10. Um, but say the average is six. Um, if you're an insomniac, you, you're two down at two, but if you start having these sleep disorders or narcolepsy, obstructive sleep apnea or narcolepsy, you're above 10. Well, residents are at 15. So that's not good to live your life that way for, you know, three to seven years, uh, depending upon you know, on what you're doing. All right. So uh, this is just the, the criteria for shift work disorder, but it's uh, this is a specific disorder. But this is essentially what's kind of happening when you're when you're having uh, 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 sleep deficits in residency. So you have these uh, symptoms that are caused that cause uh, clinically significant distress or impairment in mental, uh, physical, uh, social or occupational education, other important areas of functioning. Um, and then this, again, this disorder, you have to have the symptoms for more than three months, but that doesn't mean that if you have it for less than three months, you don't, there are no consequences. Um, so anyway, so just something to keep in mind, shift work disorder, uh, increases your risk for these things, but, it, you know, again, uh, persistent, uh, uh, sleep deficit probably increases your risk for some of these things as well. So, uh, you know, divorce, even though it's not a medical condition, it can certainly impact your life. Um, colorectal and breast cancer, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, anxiety, depression, fatigue, and then all cause mortality. So what we see is that patients with sleep, di sleep work disorder are more likely to die from something uh, earlier in their life. All right. So, uh, how to survive night float. So these are just kind of general uh, things that when you get off night float and you're, uh, try to avoid morning sunlight. Like I said, when you, when you wake up in the morning, um, you know, your body starts to, starts to kind of react to the light. And, and if you're trying to go to bed in the morning and you're getting all this light exposure, it's going to be hard to go home and go to sleep. Um, sleep in a dark, quiet room, bright light exposure upon awakening, nap before work. Uh, that's a big one, again, because you restore that adenosine uh, triphosphate. Um, the caffeine, like I mentioned, kind of blocks the, the effects of built up adenosine. And then if it's severe enough, you know, we put patients on modafinil for, for shift work. Um, because it has been shown to kind of uh, have uh, keep patients more alert. All right, so this is just something, uh, it's interesting. So again, same, same uh, uh, graph there, but how to phase shift. So if we, if we want to adjust these timings on people, what we try to do is really the light exposure. That's probably the most effective. You can use melatonin, but uh, bright light exposure just after core body temperature minimum will help advance your sleep. So that means move you to an earlier sleep. So if you're trying to go, if you usually go to bed at 10 p.m., you're trying to go to bed at 7 uh, p.m., then you can do some of these things. It takes a while. It can take up to a week or two to really shift your sleep uh, uh, appropriately. But, um, but then earlier uh, exposure to bright light in the afternoon. So after your dim light melatonin onset, so when your melatonin starts getting released, if you're exposed to light, then what that will do is help phase shift you, uh, delay your, your, your phase. So um, so if you're trying to go to sleep later, then you can push it by, by having that bright light exposure in the afternoon. The later is easier to, to adjust. Um, it kind of think about if you, if you want to stay up late one night, it's, it's decently easy to make yourself stay up a little later. However, if you one day just go, I'm going to go to bed tonight at 8 p.m. and you're used to going to bed at 11 p.m., it can be very difficult to go to bed at 8 p.m. Your body just doesn't want to sleep. And so it's always easier to, to delay the phase. Um, so just things to keep in mind. If you realize you're going to go on to, to night shift uh, or, or travel, you know, this is how we treat jet lag a lot of times is start trying to adjust to the, the new time zone uh, by doing some of these things. All right. So adapting to sleep, uh, to on-call sleep loss. Uh, the myth is I, I get uh, used to night shifts right away. I don't have any problems adjusting. Uh, but it does take about a week for your circadian rhythm and, and sleep patterns to adjust. Uh, there's another myth. I can make up my sleep loss after one night of good sleep. Uh, recovery from on-call sleep loss generally takes at least two nights of extended sleep to restore your baseline alertness. All right. So keep that in mind. 
So these, this is a, a hypnogram of, of a, a patient, a normal, kind of a normal sleep cycle in a young adult. So you see awake there, uh, stage one, two, and three. Don't worry about stage four. That's, that's not a real thing. Um, I guess it is, but it's not really. Um, so, so focus on REM is kind of up there close to awake. We, a lot of times we say REM is the deepest sleep. Um, yes and no. It's, it's actually your, your brain activity is more like you're awake. So yeah, that's why you see it close to awake. This is the chart I was talking about earlier. Throughout life, um, we actually get less slow wave sleep, which is stage three uh, and four, whatever. And then, um, and then a little bit less REM, more wake after sleep onset. That's that WASO. And then uh, your sleep latency increases a little bit, which means the time it takes you to fall asleep can increase as we get older. Um, and then also just there's really poor... Uh, sleep hygiene after people retire. But all right, so this is uh, looking at sleep fragmentation effects on sleep quality. So normal sleep is there. Uh, that's kind of the one that I showed you a couple slides ago. Then you look at on call sleep. All right, so you have morning rounds in the morning, you got to deal with this. But throughout the night, you're just constantly disrupted. You're getting up, you're getting calls, you get so you're not sleeping, sleeping throughout the night. And I'll show you on this next slide. Why does that, why is that important? Well, if you look at these two, so there's the, there's the on-call resident on top. Well, there's a patient with obstructive sleep apnea and that just based on looking at this, it looks pretty severe. And so it's not that dissimilar as far as the sleep quality that you're getting uh, from a patient with severe obstructive sleep apnea. All right. So just kind of take it at face value there that those, those are relatively similar. So specialties uh, most likely to report experiences of sleep deprivation. Um, this is just kind of a study that looked at uh, you're never sleepy, you're almost sleepy daily or, or sleepy almost daily. And these are some of the some of the residency program uh, answers. But it's kind of interesting. I don't know that I'd want a surgeon that said he was almost always sleepy operating on me. Um, all right, so cult cultural norms and sleep need. So this is kind of trying to buck the, the trend. So cultural medicine says that sleep is optional. You, you're kind of a wimp if you need it. If you come in saying, hey, I need an extra hour. Um, you know, sometimes people do look and they go, well, you know, none of the rest of us do. Um, but that's not true. And so uh, less sleep equals a more dedicated doctor. That's not true either. Um, perception that reducing work hours compromises patient care and reduces educational opportunity. We'll take a look at some of that. All right, so again, some myths. Uh, I only need five hours of sleep, so none of this applies to me. And somebody might be out there thinking that, and um, that's probably not true. There's there is some difference in tolerance of sleep loss between individuals, uh, but sleep loss is cumulative. So getting less than eight hours of sleep starts to create a sleep debt, which must be paid off. Um, whether it's on the weekends, you know, a lot of times we see people that sleep very little during the week, and then they sleep until 10, 11 a.m. on the weekends. Um, that's because you have that sleep debt that has to be paid off. Impairment of attention and working memory become evident when, individual, when individuals are limited to six hours of sleep per night. And so, uh, like I mentioned, that's that kind of that cutoff, that six hours. If you start getting less than that, you will start to see some deficits. All right. So there's this myth that I've learned not to need as much sleep during my residency. So as I've gotten throughout residency, I just get better at not sleeping. Um, but the fact is that sleep needs are genetically determined, as I mentioned earlier, they cannot be changed. And so human beings do not adapt to getting less sleep uh, than they need. Um, they can get better at telling themselves that they are, have adapted, but you don't act, your body doesn't actually adapt. Um, then learning and effort may reduce efforts, uh, or excuse me, learning and effort may reduce errors, uh, but optional, consistent, uh, uh, optimal, consistent performance worsens with sleep debt and cannot improve with learning and effort. So essentially, if you're tired and you tell yourself, I'm going to focus on this one thing, it may reduce the errors in that moment, but you're not optimally, you're not optimally performing during that moment. So you're still at increased risk, risk for errors. All right. So trying to recognize sleepiness in yourself and others. So if, if you walk in and somebody looks like this, I wouldn't ask them to help you with anything in the moment. Um, but uh, that's not uncommon, especially on nights where, where you walk around and you see people just passed out on desks. 
All right, so recognizing the warning signs. So falling asleep in conferences or on rounds. If y'all have anybody sleeping next to you right now, um, wake them up. This is a great lecture. Um, feeling restless and irritable with staff, colleagues, family, and friends. Um, you do. You, you may notice that in yourself, that when you get home, you have a little less tolerance for things uh, that normally you wouldn't get upset about, or maybe you're kind of overblowing things. Um, having to check your work repeatedly. Uh, having difficulty focusing, uh, especially on the care of your patients, driving home, things like that. I remember in, in uh, residency multiple times on nights where I'm writing a note and I doze off during the note and I wake up and I start typing again. I really, there were times I woke up in the morning and looked at that note and it did not make any sense. And so, um, but it happens and, you know, we need to make sure that, that it's not happening, especially when you're actually taking care of patients. Um, and then feeling like you just don't care, you know, maybe you're a really good person and you go into work every day going, how can I impact somebody's life? But then some days you're just so tired. You walk in and go, I just don't want to be here today. You know, that's a problem. All right. So, um, how I, so some people might say, I can tell how tired I am. And I know when I'm not functioning up to par, but the fact is the sleepier you are, the less accurate per your perception uh, of degree of impairment is there's, I had some data on this on here, but then it was kind of, uh, kind of dense. So I took it off, but it, it is true that they've done studies where they, they ask people, how sleepy do you feel you are? And what do you think that you've done wrong? And then they can actually prove, no, you're actually, you, you have more problems than you're perceiving. All right. And so then uh, another fact, you can fall asleep briefly. It's called micro sleeps without knowing it. Um, you may, again, you may kind of think back and go, yeah, I've done that. That's kind of when you're sitting in a lecture and you're, you're trying to keep your eyes open and you're like, just stay awake. All right. There are moments you're for just seconds, you're kind of blacking out there. And then you go, what were they just talking about? That's a micro sleep. You're kind of going in and out of sleep. Uh, just that very light stage one, probably. Um, so micro sleeps, unintentional episodes of sleep, typically between five to 14 seconds in duration, cause sleep depth, uh, sleep deprivation, uh, behavioral correlates, head nods, drooping eyelids, subjective unawareness or spacing out. All right. Keep this in mind. So when you're if you do this at, while you're driving home, if you're sleepy and, and you're driving home, you have a little micro sleep. A car driving 60 miles an hour will travel more than 250 feet during a three second micro sleep. A lot of damage can be done by a 60 mile an hour car in three seconds, guys. All right. So um, residents can have sleep disorders, too. So on top of all that, you're working hard, you're getting stepped up. Maybe you have obstructive sleep apnea, narcolepsy, insomnia. Uh, advanced or delayed sleep phase disorders, um, uh, medication-induced insomnia or hypersomnia, increased sleepiness, uh, restless leg syndrome, and then substance abuse, which is, is uh, unfortunate, but it's true. And so if you have you know, alcohol, alcohol can help you fall asleep sometimes, but it doesn't help your quality of sleep. Um, other substances can cause sleep disorders as well. Um, this is kind of the same thing. So consequences of sleep deprivation, patient care, learning, health and well-being, family relationships, mood and performance, workplace, driving safety, kind of touched on all those. Um, this was a study they did that showed um, stress, uh, stress, learning, impairment, um, uh, and then self-impairment, and then feeling belittled or humiliated. And so uh, as you have sleep deprivation, these things increase. As you get better sleep as nightly sleep increases um your your learning ability increases and all the other things that are negative in life decrease so uh so this is this is interesting all right and then again kind of impact on professionalism so you know you're trying to do the best you can for your patients but if you're too sleepy then essentially your patient becomes the enemy because it's the only thing that's keeping you from sleep and so uh so that's a that's not a great way to be on especially on nights when you know, you're getting a call about a patient and you're like, you know, I was just sleeping well and now they're asking me to go do this and I don't want to do it. Well, you know, that's not uncommon. You're not, you're not a bad person for doing that, um, but it's not good patient care. All right, so uh, this is just some, some statistics, odd ratios, uh, residents averaging less than five hours of sleep per night. Their involvement in malpractice suits increase, use of medication to stay awake increase, a serious conflict with other residents as well as nursing staff increases, uh, accidents, injuries, making a serious medical error, noticeable weight changes, and increased use of alcohol. All right, so how are we doing on time? All right, impact on performance and patient safety. All right, so resident self-reported errors 
uh, increase with the less sleep you have. All right. And th so do the, uh, so that's self-reported errors. And then also the adverse events that are, that can happen to your patients increase with the less sleep that you have. So we want to make sure that we try to reduce these as much as possible. All right. Intern sleep and patient safety studies, 36% more serious errors on a traditional schedule, including five times as many serious diagnostic errors. So, you know, sometimes you may not even realize it. You may look at a patient and go, this is what's wrong with them. Let's treat them that way. You walk off to another patient. Well, maybe you were just too, a little too sleepy to look through everything. That's not their actual diagnosis. Now we're mistreating this patient. All right. So, um, sorry. So this is residency specific data. So surgery, there were 20% more errors and 14% more time required to perform simulated laparoscopic post lapar la uh, laparoscopy. Um, post-call. And so that was two different studies that showed that. Um, internal medicine, efficiency and accuracy of ECG interpretations were impaired on sleep derived, deprived interns. Pediatrics, time to place an intra-arterial line increased significantly in sleep deprived residents. And those arteries are already pretty small. So significant reductions in comprehensiveness of history and physical exam documentation. And then uh, scores achieved on the American Board of Family Medicine practice in training exams decreased with sleepiness. All right, so you have some consequences. 58% of emergency medicine residents reported near crashes uh, driving home uh, or, to, or to work. 80% were post night shift, increased with the number of night shifts per month. All right, 50% greater risk of bloodborne pathogen exposure incidents. Um, the last thing you want to do is stick yourself or somebody else and have a lifelong disease because you were sleepy. All right. Impact on personal health and safety. So, so again, this kind of gets back into um, the, the different organ systems that are, that are involved with the circadian rhythm, sleep, and things like that, but also the consequences. If you don't get enough sleep, what happens? So, uh, sleep deprivation decreases your leptin levels. Your leptin levels are the things that tell you. So if you start eating, if you're hungry, you start eating your leptin levels, uh, uh, your leptin levels increase telling you, you know, you're not hungry anymore. If you're sleep deprived, your leptin levels are very low. You might feel hungry all the time. Um, increased ghrelin levels when you have sleep deprivation. Um, the way I remember this, one of my, one of my, uh, uh, professors back in medical school said, you know, just remember ghrelin. It's like somebody's grilling. And then you'll remember you want to eat that. And so when ghrelin levels go up, um, you're hungry. You want to eat. And you also have an increased um, appetite for food with high carbohydrate content. And so a lot of this is why you gain weight. If you Why, why there's an association with weight gain with sleep deprivation and, and also with sh uh, shift work disorder. And uh, the, the, the reason is because you have, you have these problems. You, so your ghrelin levels are high. You feel hungry all the time. You're eating less healthy foods because you have this, this uh, craving for those types of foods. And then also, I mean, the, the, sometimes the, the options that we have available um, are not the best. So I, I remember where, where I trained, um, the grill was open in the middle of the night, but the salad bar wasn't. So, um, so anyway, it's just kind of interesting. All right, so resident well-being, pregnant, so pregnant residents had more complications uh, with sleep deprivation. So preterm labor, longer labor, increased pain perception and discomfort. There are a couple other things as well, but uh, resident depression has been associated with chronic sleep deprivation. So in one year, they had uh, a program where residents, or well, a couple different programs, where residents at the beginning of the year, 4% uh, had moderate depression. By the end of the year, 30% had moderate depression. Uh, up to up to 75 percent of residents report burnout symptoms with positive associations with increased workload and work hours. All right. So uh, I left this chart because um, uh, this just shows uh, activity, activity, the actigraphy based sleep duration. So this is, we, you know, essentially kind of where this device it tells us kind of when you're active, when you're not. When you're not active, we assume you're sleeping, but it's not 100 percent accurate. It's pretty good. Um, so this, this predicts the, the likelihood of being um, uh, clinically protected from uh, uh, a vaccine six months after they got the hepatitis B immunization. So, 
So I don't, I don't think this was resonance, but patients with less than six hours of sleep on a nightly average were less likely to be immunized after receiving the immunization. So we know that there is an impact on your immune system. All right, so again, this is kind of same things that we've been talking about. So, um, so sleep deprivation increases your risk for cardiovascular disease, hypertension, uh, myocardial infarction, strokes, high cholesterol, impotence, shortened lifespan, cancers, especially breast cancer. All right, um, this was a Harvard work uh, hours. So for each extended duration work shift scheduled per month, interns had increased monthly risk of any motor vehicle crash, increased monthly risk of a motor vehicle crash on the commute from work. Um, and so, so this is, you know, can impact you even after you leave the hospital and, and in a very permanent way. Um, recognizing signs of driving while drowsy. All right, so if you're, you have trouble focusing on the road, difficulty keeping your eyes open, nodding, yawning repeatedly, repeatedly uh, drifting from your lane, missing signs or exits, not remembering driving the last few miles, closing your eyes at stoplights. Think about these for a minute. If somebody was at a party and they drank too much, they would have a lot of these and they would not be allowed on the road. But when we're, when we're residents, it's okay. Um, but it's really not, it's not okay. If you're that tired, then you need to pull off, get some sleep, take a nap before you leave work, something like that. Because again, you know, if you, if you hurt yourself or kill somebody on the way home, uh, it's going to impact a lot more. Uh, you're going to have some regrets. All right. Um, so driving, uh, dr drowsy driving, uh, what works? So avoid driving. If you're drowsy, try to pull over, get in the nap. Like I said, take a nap before you leave work. Um, if you're really sleepy, get a ride home. Do y'all still have the uh, GME money to, to get an Uber or something? Did they do that? Okay. You don't know? You should ask about that. I, th I think they do. They, they started doing that when I was in uh, residency back in like 2018 or something, I think. Um, they started, and, and it was because we had a guy that got in a wreck on the way home, uh, believe it or not. Um, and he, did, he was, didn't end up being injured, but he, he could have. Uh, what doesn't work? Turning up the radio, opening the all the things that you think works, they don't. And so, um, so, you know, keep that in mind. All right. So reducing the impact of sleep loss. Uh, so the biggest thing is avoid starting out with a sleep deficit. So they did this study where even on uh, light or no call rotations, residents do not obtain adequate sleep. And that's because, and, and a lot of that, I mean, you know, I get it. And I think a lot of people understand you work hard during the day. You get home at night. You want to spend time doing things you enjoy. And uh, sleep isn't super exciting. So nobody goes home uh, most nights and goes, I can't wait to just lie my head down. And so you watch a movie on Netflix. And then you watch another movie on Netflix. And then you watch another movie on Netflix. And then you play a game on your phone. And so so in, anyway, those are things that, um, you know, try to reduce. Uh, when you get home, make sure you're getting enough sleep. So a myth, all I need is my usual five to six hours the night after call and I'm fine. Uh, recovery from on-call sleep, like I said, takes two nights. Um, and then recovery sleep generally has a higher percentage of deep that in the, the stage three uh, slow wave sleep, which is needed to counteract the effects of sleep loss. So we see that in patients all the time on sleep studies. They come in and they haven't been sleeping well and they're, they're, they finally get a good night of sleep and their in three sleep is like through the roof um, or stage three, excuse me, stage three sleep. Uh, is through the roof. All right, so healthy sleep habits. Uh, realize that circadian rhythms and sleep needs are non-negotiable. Like I said, your body has this, it's a genetic set setting. You, you can't change your own uh, sleep habit or, or sleep uh, needs. Uh, go to bed and get up about the same time every day. Uh, that will help you throughout life. If you can set your alarm for the same time and get up every day on the weekdays and the weekends. Now I get that you don't, you may not want to wake up at 6 a.m. on the weekends, but um, but one, especially once you get out of residency, if you get into a routine and you start waking up at the same day, every, every day, that will help you, um, develop a, a pre-sleep routine. So this is what I was talking about. It's easy to do in kids, you know, let's go get a bath, go brush your teeth, get your pajamas on, things like that. Um, but in adults, we, we have terrible sleep routines. And so by improving that it, it can help, uh, overall sleep quality. And then also your, your daytime symptoms. Um, use relaxation to help you fall asleep. One of the best things I tell my patients all the time is, is look, is Google's, uh, cognitive behavioral, uh, therapy for insomnia. And there are all kinds of re relaxation techniques that do help. 
and they'll help you fall asleep. So if you're having trouble falling asleep, um, a lot of times you can do these relaxation, breathing techniques, things like that. Uh, and, and it'll help protect your sleep time. So tell your family and friends, Hey, don't bother me after this time. Or, you know, now it's easy with the, with the phones. I mean, you can set these, uh, set these don't alert me, um, settings. And, and so just make sure that, that you're getting enough sleep and that you're protecting your sleep once you are sleeping and then get seven to nine hours before anticipated sleep, so sleep loss. So like I just said on the last slide, the last thing you want to do is go into night float, um, and, and not slept well the night before that. All right, so a uh, good sleeping environment is a cool, dark uh, place, uh, quiet. Um, one of the things that uh, a lot of people have still are alarm clocks. And so they have those big, brighter uh, red or green numbers. And uh, that's like one of the worst things you can do, not only because of the light, but also because if you wake up in the middle of the night and you look at that thing and you go, I have to be up in 30 minutes then like you're not falling back asleep. But if you don't know what time it is, and it could be 2 a.m., you might get another 30 minutes of great sleep. Um, but anyway, get regular exercise. So there used to be this thought that, that if, you, if you exercise right before you go to sleep, then there's no way you're going to sleep. Um, they've done studies, and they actually show that more consistent exercise, no matter what time it is, will improve sleep quality. Um, avoid using alcohol to help you fall asleep. Alcohol does help you fall asleep, but the quality of sleep is poor. And then also it wakes you up early and then, it, then you will have more difficulty falling back asleep. Um, you may, you know, people that, that drink alcohol may have noticed that. Um, avoid using, uh, so that was the, yeah, so napping. So napping does temporarily improve alertness like we talked about, building back up your ATP, things like that. Um, short naps should be no, no longer than 20 to 30 minutes. Um, again, that's for that sleep inertia. So if you start, if you wake up after an hour, you may notice that you actually feel more tired than when you went to sleep. And that's because your body gets, it starts saying, okay, let's start all these other processes during sleep. And it wants you to stay asleep. So you, you don't wake up feeling alert and rested, but 20 to 30 minute naps are usually okay. Um, and then take advantage of the circadian windows of opportunity. So remember those little troughs that we talked about on the, uh, the, the uh, process C and S um, model. So, so those troughs, that's when your body naturally wants to take naps. Um, that's, that's why siestas occur. That's why they, they, they were invented, you know, is essentially they, uh, they, that's when their bodies naturally went to sleep. So people have been doing it for a long time. Um, uh, so caffeine, we mentioned that it decreases the, the effects of the adenosine. So it will help you stay up a little bit longer. Um, it's half-life is, I tell people about six hours, um, so if you're taking, if you're drinking coffee, like right before you're supposed to go home. So say you're on a night float, you get off at 7 a.m. and you drink coffee because you're tired at 530, then it may be difficult to, to fall asleep when you get home. But it can help, especially if you do it early and kind of midway through shifts uh, or just before work. All right, so operational measures. So back in 2010, ACGME set these duty hour standards, excuse me, and they, um, they said, okay, we're going to, we're going to help everybody get more sleep and improve patient care. Well, like I said, first of all, residents didn't go home and sleep. And then they, they showed this, that focusing only on duty hours alone has not resulted in improvements in patient care or resident well-being. The added uh, duty hour restrictions implemented appear to have had an unintended negative impact on resident education. So, um, you know, there is a balance. I'm a, so, yeah, I'm a sleep physician and, and we do need to make sure that everybody's getting enough sleep and that they're performing um, optimally. But there is a balance where you say, OK, if we're doing it, if we're focusing on it too much, then you start to have decline in educational opportunities. And and so, that, you know, but it's a it's a delicate balance. And so um, so in 2017, they changed some of these things and set high requirements for teamwork, professionalism, communication, all these things. Like I said, that, that was around the time when I know UT and Memphis started offering the, the rides home and things like that as well. So some kind of a, a resource to use. All right. So things that y'all can do uh, as residents or your residency uh, coordinators or, or uh, directors can do. Um, so schedule conferences at a time where, where floats can attend videotapes so residents can watch. Uh, when they're more alert, 
uh, distribute handouts, uh, reinforce messages on rounds. You know, a lot of a lot of learning is just repetition. So if you're doing it when you're more awake, it's going to be way more useful and, uh, than than if you're trying to get through a lecture when you're when you're sleepy. Um, achieving and competency uh, education is about learning how to do something right, not just the numbers of times that it's done. So um, especially if you're you're tired and you're kind of getting these bad habits. Uh, just doing it over and over just kind of reinforces those bad habits uh, or incorrect learning or however you want to look at that. Um, and then uh, attending time, make sure that, that that's incorporated into rotations, including night float, that you're getting something out of night float, not just coming to work and, and kind of be a, a paper pusher. All right. So I kept these in because um, my predecessor, Dr. Sethi, who, who provided these slides to me, uh, and I appreciate very much for most of these slides. Um uh, kind of had this quote. So this was said by the, the American College of Surgeons in, two, er, excuse me, in 1994. Uh, Patients have a right to expect a healthy, alert, responsible, and responsive uh, physician. Um, but providers also have a right to experience a healthy, alert, well-rested, and highly functional lifestyle. And so that was uh, Dr. Sethi who said that. Uh, he left that on there, the BC statement before COVID. COVID kind of threw that stuff out the window. Um, all right, so the take-home points. Uh, improvement in sleep duration and quality improves patient care and outcomes, but also improves resident health and quality of life. So um, we need to make sure that that is, that is a priority. Uh, impairment due to sleep deprivation or fatigue is no different than impairment due to alcohol or other drugs. So if you think about it, if you drink enough alcohol, you're going to be pretty impaired when you drive home. I promise you that I can keep you awake until you're just as impaired as that. So um, we need to make sure that that's not happening. Drowsiness, sleepiness, and fatigue in residency cannot be eliminated. Um, you know, we concede that, but uh, can be managed. And so some of the tools on here uh, that I mentioned um, can help with that. Uh, recognizing signs of fatigue is key to managing sleepiness and decreasing risk for yourself and your patient. So make sure that you're thinking about these things. If you don't think that you're getting enough sleep, you're probably not getting enough sleep and start looking for some of the signs that I mentioned so that you can kind of, kind of uh, get in front of it instead of continuing that, uh, the sleep deprivation. And then if sleepiness uh, or fatigue is interfering with your performance or health, let your supervisors and program director know. Um, they should be aware of that. They should be able to kind of uh, help you with that. Um, if you need to see a physician, you know, I'm here. There are other physicians here that can see you and, and make sure that you don't have a problem uh, as I mentioned, residents can have sleep issues as well. So like, like primary sleep problems. Um, one of the things that, that I kind of take, that I had experience with this guy in Tampa. Um, he was in the military and he finished his time in the military. He's a mechanic. And um, when he left the military, he came to the VA in Tampa and he said, and he was still a pretty young guy. And he said, uh, you know, I've, I've always been sleeping. I've gotten in so much trouble when I was in the military um, for falling asleep. And, uh, and I mean, this guy was working on people's aircraft and, 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 uh, you know, vehicles and falling asleep, like while he's doing it. And it turned out he had idiopathic hypersomnia. And so we got him on meds and it, it improved, but he went through his whole military career, um, sleeping and putting people, I mean, he wasn't doing it, but you know, he's putting people in these vehicles that maybe they'll work. Like, I don't know that I'd want to get in one of those. And so, so my point is that if you, if you notice that you're having these problems and that none of the adjustments that you're making are helping, go see somebody about it. Make sure that somebody knows about it. All right. So I uh, hope you got some good sleep information. Anybody have any questions? All right. Y'all have a good day.